Hello and welcome to the SNEA Compute Memory and Storage Initiative and the SNEA Networking Storage Forum webcast titled Storage Life on the Edge, Edge Use Cases. Before we begin, I'd like to just give a few simple reminders that make this webcast better for all of us. Um, first, for you, um, open your web browser in full screen mode so that you can easily see small text that occasionally exists in our slides. We have quite a bit of detail and it's easiest to view when you're in full screen mode. Uh, next, you can make this an interactive by submitting your questions during the presentation. Uh, we will have a panel discussion and we will do our best to answer all of the questions as time permits after our presenters present. Questions we don't get to as well as those we do will be answered in a SNEA Q&A blog. You can download a copy of the slides for today's presentation. They are available at the attachments tab at the bottom of your screen. And finally, please give us your feedback at the end so that we can continue to improve our presentations for you. Now, with that, I do have a legal notice that we have to put up here. I'm not going to read this all. I am not a lawyer. What I do want to note is that there are no warranties expressed or implied by this presentation. And moving on, I'd like to introduce those of us who are here today who will be presenting. I am Bill Martin. I am the moderator for today. I am co-chair of the SNEA Technical Council and chair of the SNEA Compute Memory and Storage Initiative, as well as working for Samsung in their storage SSD IO standards uh, development. Um, our expert panelists today are Mayank Saxena. He is a senior director of engineering at Samsung. Um, he is a seasoned storage engineering leader focused on building innovative products at scale. Has over 20 years in technology R&D, software development, product development, and team building experiences at companies like NetApp, Microsoft Research, HP Labs, and Samsung. He successfully co-founded a startup in the field of cloud and IoT data processing. As an inventor, he holds multiple US patents in the area of storage, data security, and distributed networking. He holds an MS in computer science from the University of Southern California. Next is Stephen Bates, who is CTO at Identicom where he focuses on applying emerging technologies such as NVMe, RDMA, new non-volatile memories, and advanced programmable logic to create complex storage and communication systems. He has combined several such technologies to implement computational storage that offers performance well above today's production systems. He is also an active contributor to the Linux kernel. And finally, we have Tong Zhang, co-founder and chief scientist at Scaleflux, responsible for developing new approaches for computational storage products and exploring use cases in mainstream applications such as databases. He is also a professor at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, where his research areas include databases, file systems, solid state storage, digital signal processing, error correcting coding, and device and computer architecture. So who are we? Uh, SNEA is the Storage Networking Industry Association. It has a broad reach within the industry developing standards. The, the organization is comprised of 180 industry leading organizations with over 2,500 active members supporting over 50,000 IT end users and storage professionals around the world. This webcast is being put on by the SNEA Networking Storage Found Forum and the Compute Memory and Storage Initiative, each which are part of SNEA. Um, these organizations are responsible for outreach and education on the technology areas and related SNEA technical activities that you see here on this slide. So there's a wide amount of information that is being provided by these two organizations within SNEA. Um, we'll provide more information on how to learn about these groups as well as other SNEA activities 
at the end of the webcast. For this webcast, we will begin by presenting a recap of the Storage Life on the Edge series, followed by Edge use case presentations by each of our experts. Following the presentation by each of our experts, we will open the webcast up to a panel discussion where our experts will answer your questions on Edge use cases. So to recap where we are, um, today's webcast is part of a series called Storage Life on the Edge. The first presentation in this series was done on January 26th, where a SNEA presenter set the stage on key consideration for managing and processing data sent, created at the edge, covering data and compute pressure points, aggregation, near and far edge. Talked about supporting edge workloads, analytics and AI considerations, understanding data lifecycle to generate insights, governance, security, and privacy overview, and optimizing for CapEx and OpEx. If you missed the session, it's available on demand at the URL in the slides that you can download. Um, the pointer to where you can get at that is at the bottom of this screen, um, but also if you download the slides, you'll be able to click on that. So I will now uh, turn the presentation over to Mayank Saxena. Thanks, Bill. Uh, hello, everyone. I am Mayank Saxena, and uh, glad to be part of this talk. And I am fortunate uh, enough to be on the both sides of the coin, which is at the edge and the storage. Uh, I have co-founded a company in the IoT and edge space, and also lead storage products as I am doing in Samsung now as well. And hence, this topic comes uh, natural to me. Uh, with that, let's uh, dive into it. Uh, in my talk, I will cover the needs and challenges of data at the edge and what the edge data life cycle is and how near data processing can greatly enhance some of the SLAs. Uh, other two panelists, uh, Stephen and Tong, will go deeper uh, with the specific use cases. So at the edge, uh, it is very important to understand data is as good as the information it provides in near real time fashion. So it is all about the analytics and predictions. So as shown in the slide on the left image, you have two major types of analytics. Uh, first is image or video. Big objects uh, requires expensive operations on these data. For example, compression, decompression, encoding, decoding, classifications, et cetera. The other one, textual data, which is unstructured and unorganized, but can run traditional database queries, for example, on SQLite, JSON, et cetera, right? But now let's decompose need of these analytics from solution design perspective. So on the right side table, I have a comparative uh, edge analytics column compared to cloud. So at the edge, uh, where is it deployed? As we know, it's in the edge device, uh, can be a server, router, or sensors, right? What is the age of data? Way younger compared to the cloud. How are they deployed? It's uh, very widely fragmented, and it will be like that uh, going forward as well. Size of data, way smaller compared to the big cloud. Uh, nature of applications, not advanced, and will remain unsophisticated compared to cloud, always. Storage footprint, as we all know, much smaller. An important thing to understand that from the quality of service improvisation, edge analytics will always depend on the cloud. Performance expectation is always near real time. And these are the attributes which defines how we should evolve storage layer to support edge use cases. 
So now let's talk about the challenges and requirement of edge data lifecycle. At the high level, there are four major constants when you're looking at such a use case, right? Uh, one is the TCO, that is cost-effective solutions. Second one is security parameter and domain awareness across various layers of the system. As these different layers are administered a different entity. Thirdly, uh, data privacy, especially when data hops from one domain to another domain. And the most important one is the simplicity from the operational standpoint. With all these constraints, real need is still speed. So on the right image uh, shown is a typical deployment uh, from cloud to edge system. Uh, which is not as complex as it looks, but one needs to be aware of the intricacies. There are uh, three main layers. Top one, the cloud layer, uh, all the major cloud providers, or it can be an um, industrial control system sitting in, in some enterprise data center. Bottom one, the edge sensor layer, uh, which are the source of data inputs with heterogeneous data format. And the middle one, that is edge cloud, is the main layer here. Comprises of edge cloudlets, shown in little umbrellas here. Uh, these cloudlet contains one new server or small edge gateways, maybe in a rack, uh, sitting in a control room. Number of these cloudlets can be on the same location. For example, in case of industrial plants, or they can be miles apart, as in the case of smart cities, connected through with their own dedicated network, which is different than the network they're connected to the top layer. And that's an important aspect to understand, because that makes the uh, processing of information in this layer very critical given the four major constants we talked about. And some of the emerging use cases uh, for uh, such information processing and at the edge cloud layer are uh, distributed analytics uh, at the edge cloud, uh, federated AI, and near real-time anomaly detections. All right, uh, so now let's understand the nature of this ecosystem, uh, data journey, and the governance aspect, and how computational storage can improve the experience and all these three aspects providing high performance edge data. As shown here uh, on top, uh, there are standard edge applications like uh, SoloVens or Elastic or Splunk uh, sitting on top of data lake and standard tools like Spark or PyTorch or TensorFlow-based frameworks. Utilizing various uh, emerging edge to cloud frameworks, as we all know, like you know, IoT hubs from different cloud providers from Azure to the uh, AWS Greengrass to GCP, or it can be completely homegrown framework. Then there is a network component, which mainly segmented into two. One is the ISP network, which is slow and costly. And the other, in, other one is the uh, LAN-based mesh uh, for having high-performance data pr processing and inferencing. Connecting all the edge gateways or servers. Edge gateways, a part of this, uh, uh, this edge cloudlet mesh, are the main interest here. Uh, its CPU today performs relatively repetitive and mundane tasks uh, like uh, frequent uh, data queries. For example, uh, how many times I have seen port scanning on the network for a particular node, right? Uh, anonymization, for example, uh, pattern searching of uh, certain key keywords and uh, pre-process them. Compression, like compression and decompression on data at rest. Security tasks, uh, for example, 
key-based encryption. All these tasks can be offloaded to computational storage. Think of it as an edge computation storage engine with a standard interface on the storage device itself. It is not only super cost effective and improves performance, but, and importantly, it does help the ecosystem as well, where CPUs mainly just need to worry about the governance and handling of the transport protocols up and horizontally. With that, I will uh, pass it on to uh, Stephen Bates from Editicom, who will further walk us through some specific solutions. Thank you. Thanks so much. That's a great introduction. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, I'm Stephen Bates out of Dedicom. So I have a couple of slides, and we're going to dig a little deeper into a couple of specific edge use cases. And the previous speaker picked up on some themes that I think are very important for the edge. I think, um, you know, as 5G networks start to roll out, as Internet of Things sensors become more common, and, and as we use AI to try and gain business insights from a lot of unstructured data, the, the importance of the edge and the importance that the edge provides services in close to real time is, is very important. But also the volume of data and the nature of that data is changing. Um, IoT streams of data tend to be unstructured. They don't necessarily form or conform to a given schema. Uh, and so it becomes very, very challenging to parse that data in close to real time. And there's a lot of data that needs to be parsed. So where can computational storage play in this space? Uh, one of the solutions that we have in this space, uh, previous speaker spoke to this a little bit, is, is around these streams of data that are coming from either IoT devices or smart city devices uh, or something else. Uh, we've worked in partnership with Cisco and their server division to provide a computational storage solution that's based on our computational storage processors, something we call no load, um, to, to provide compression on data that resides in a Spark-based system. So you know, the previous uh, speaker talked a bit about Spark. Spark is an excellent edge application. It can process and query a lot of unstructured data that's coming from edge devices, and it can gain business insights and also perform a first level of filtering. You know, I, I think one of the challenges with edge is minimizing the amount of data that we need to send from the edge back to the data center. Um, as this previous speaker noted, that can be quite expensive. Excuse me, I have a bit of a cold, so excuse me. Um, the, the, that transfer of data can be quite expensive. So we'd like to not move data back to the data center if we can. Um, so instead, we'd like to process data at the edge. But another thing that's very clear is that the amount of physical space you have at the edge is limited. Um, often you're renting space from a telco provider uh, these spaces are often in, you know, downtown cities. They can be very expensive to rent. Um, you know, rack units can rent for, for very large amounts of money. So the more data you can store in a rack unit, uh, the better, um, because it, that, that will save you monthly rental costs. So the solution that we developed with Cisco uh, basically provides uh, increased capacity uh, via compression but it didn't affect the performance of the application in any way. And also the way that we did this, and I think this is a really important point, and I think this will come up in the Q&A, we didn't require customers to change Spark in any way. Um, so computational storage can be deployed in a couple of different ways. One way is transparently, so in a way where the application doesn't need to be changed in order to take advantage of it, uh, which is in this case here. Uh, the other is in a case where the application does have to be updated, there are potentially new libraries that have to be created and linked into the application. And that's work that's being done within standards bodies like SNEA and NVMe. 
Uh, and that ties into the ecosystem around computational storage, which hopefully we'll get into a little bit more in, in the Q&A. And we can talk about some of the work that's being done at SNEA and within the NVMe standard uh, to, to help facilitate that deployment. And then the other use case that I want to look at is, is more accelerating applications like databases themselves. So, you know, I think uh, traditionally what we do is uh, in a database is we capture a large amount of data, that data resides on disk. And then in order to ask a question of the data in that database, we have to formulate an, something like an SQL query. And then we have to pull all the data off those disks and, and basically ask that question over and over again against the data as it streams through memory on the host server. So, you know, do you have a certain text string in this particular field or is this, can we average everything in this particular column? Now that's not incredibly efficient because we're moving a lot of data around. And one of the objectives or one of the benefits of computational storage is trying to process data closer to the data. Um, Companies like Samsung and Scaleflux and ourselves all have products in this space. And this is a category of product that is sometimes called the computational storage drive, where you put computation right beside the NAND on the solid state drive. Uh, in this case, what happens then is rather than pulling the data, data off the drives uh, and asking queries, um, you can actually push the query to the drive using some kind of protocol, whether that's NVMe or vendor specific. Um, it doesn't really matter. And what you can do then is massively improve the efficiency of the system. And that's really important for the edge because as well as having physical limitations on edge deployments, you often have power envelopes that are very tightly constrained. Um, and remember, this isn't your data center typically, you're renting space in a point of presence. You may have strict requirements on how much power you're allowed to consume. So being able to work, you know, to achieve a certain level of performance for a lot less power is really important. And is one of the goals of, excuse me, computational storage on the edge. Um, being able to do this at low latency uh, feeds into that requirement about real time data analytics. Can I get answers to business questions uh, in close to real time? And it also allows for that filtering I mentioned earlier. Can I reduce the volume of data that I need to move to the backend data center because those uplinks are incredibly expensive. In order to do this, we really do need to have an ecosystem around open standards, vendor neutrality. Can I buy multiple different products from multiple different vendors and expect them to interoperate? And again, I think that's a, a really important question and one I hope we get to in the Q&A. So this is a couple of examples of deploying computational storage on the edge. Um, and now I'm gonna pass on to Tong, who is going to talk about it from a Skillflux perspective. Thank you, thank you, Stephen. Um, yeah, this is uh, Tong Zhang uh, from Skillflux. It's really uh, my great honor and pleasure to have this opportunity to uh, talk about uh, computational storage in edge infrastructure. So today I will just very briefly uh, go through uh, two particular uh, kind of use cases that uh, uh, we are working with our partners now on how we can innovate and improve the efficiency of uh, edge infrastructure with the emerging computational storage drive. So. So the first use case uh, really kind of centers around we call the retail chain. So this is what we are doing with a company called Scale Computing. Um, that uh, that company really kind of uh, specialize on edge computing infrastructure. So uh, we all know that uh, a retail facility really has a kind of a much much less controlled environment, uh, especially compared with normal like data centers. So um, at, so as a result, the edge servers. In the uh, in the retail chain, typically have pretty like a high or extreme pressure on things like uh, cost, physical space, and uh, thermals. So uh, so here the computational storage drive could potentially help to uh, enable you know additional computation or management capabilities 
that uh, otherwise could not be afforded. So subject to the cost, power, and uh, compute constraints. And also moreover, the computational storage drive could also help with the thermal management. Basically the key idea has, is quite straightforward because we can distribute the processing tasks across those multiple computational storage drives other than consolidating or pushing those uh, uh, heavy duty computational tasks to the central higher power CPUs. So really in this context, the most convenient and low hanging fruit is that uh, exactly as the previous two speakers had already touched upon that uh, the computational storage drive could uh, natively provide the transparent, uh, transparent lossless data compression that uh, can really very natively and seamlessly benefit the edge servers without any uh, extra software development co uh, cost and without uh, disrupting the existing software ecosystem. And certainly if we want to go further, uh, edge servers could migrate certain uh, like a data transformation or pre-processing like some uh, data filtering in the queries uh, into the computational storage drive to further improve the overall efficiency of the compute of the of the of the edge computing uh, infrastructure. So the really the second use case is what we are exploring with a company called Protopia. Uh, it is a quite interesting startup company that uh, uh, on developing some very, very interesting innovative solution to improve the security and the privacy um, in uh, like in AI um, kind of in, in the AI ecosystem. We know that uh, there are many scenarios where uh, the edge sensors really capture the data like image, video, and the speech and the transfer those data to the, the backbone data center for real further AI processing. So um, to improve the security and uh, protect the privacy, the company Protopia really developed a kind of a platform that enables the edge sensors to very appropriately transform the captured data uh, before the transmission in such a way that we can minimize the risk of misuse of the data or like unintended inference from the data or like a, um, unintended model training based upon the data. So then in this case, the edge server CPU and the computational storage drive could uh, very cohesively work together to carry out the data transformation uh, most effectively. So these are just the two examples of many, many possibilities on how the computational storage could uh, really facilitate the deployment and the optimization of edge computing infrastructure. So we really look forward to working with the whole industry to explore this uh, very exciting journey. So yeah, back to Bill. Thank you all for your great presentations. Um, at this point in time, we're going to open up and start taking questions. Uh, we have some questions already from the audience. Uh, please submit your questions using the question tab and we will get to as many of those questions as possible. Uh, but to start it off, um, I'd like to ask a question. This uh, I'd like to start off with Mayank, um, and the question is, would computational storage require its own and new software stack for vendors to incorporate into their existing solutions? Uh, so Mayank, if you could start with that, but then um, open it up for Stephen or Tong to contribute as well. Sure. Um, this is a very important question. Uh, I'm glad you someone asked uh, because uh, for our uh, product leaders uh, at the edge anytime there's a new technology right first question 
what's the backward compatibility of this technology and how complex it is to support. Uh, I completely uh, envision that computational storage should be a drop-in replacement to existing storage in the system. And uh, all the pre prevalent IoT framework or even the homegrown ones uh, should be able to identify this as a new capability of existing resource type, that is storage, uh, through their IoT control agent uh, and the edge server or gateway which should be programmable and create workflows using their currently used standard dashboards. So I don't uh, envision any kind of uh, forklift change should be required to adopt this kind of new capability of storage. And I, I see no reason why it can't be that way. But I'll, I'll pass it on to Stephen or Tom if they'd like to add something. Yeah, I totally agree that uh, really uh, like uh, to, because really at the scale flux, when we push our product on the computational storage drive, where most, the really the most questions where we were asked is that uh, how, how much we need to change our like uh, operating system, uh, how to, how do we, uh, whether we need to change the database application source code. So really I think the, for the, uh, for the first step, for the step along this long journey, I think it's critically important that, that to keep this uh, the interface between the hardware and the existing software ecosystem as clean, as simple as possible. But even for that, but it's, it, there are still a lot of uh, innovation possibility enabled by computational storage drive. For example, like if the drive can do the in-story transparent compression, we still keep the existing the NVMe interface unchanged, then how the database, how the file system and can take advantage of this uh, uh, new transparent compression capability. So to do the change only inside the software stack without changing the interface, we, we do see a lot, lot of uh, very exciting potential even over there without changing the interface. Yeah. So I'll jump in and maybe take a slightly different angle on some of this. I, I do believe there are two kind of categories of applications that computational storage can, um, can uh, add enhancements to. And I think the first set is like Tong um, mentioned, you know, that there, there's a set of applications or a set of functions that we can do with minimal, perhaps even zero changes to the software that's running on the edge devices. And that, that leads to you know, significant benefits and, and that in and of itself is an interesting market. I think once you start um, into the more analytic side of things, so asking questions of data that resides on disks, uh, perhaps pushing more complicated jobs from the host down to the storage layer, then we do have to think about making some changes. And I totally agree that that is a challenge in the industry because customers don't like that. And I think one of the ways to tackle that is through open standards, open source, uh, and open ecosystem development. So in the same way that we've developed libraries for things like multi-core processors or graphic card offloads, um, and over time applications have updated to take advantage of those libraries, for computational storage, we're going to have to see libraries be developed, um, open source, multi-company developments, uh, and we'll have to standardize on interfaces into these computational storage devices. Um, that's that's a, a, a place where SNEA uh, uh, is doing an awful lot of work uh, in their computational storage working group. And NVMe is also doing quite a bit of work at the kind of lower device level in terms of how do we how do we as a how do we as an industry come up with open vendor neutral standards that allow us to communicate with these devices and one of the analogies i love to use is um, when pcie ssds first came out every single one of them had a different driver so you buy one from intel it would have an intel driver you drive one from fusion io it would have a fusion io driver now when i pick up a pcie ssd from anywhere, I, I don't even think about what driver it's going to use. It's going to use NVMe, right? And 
Um, it would be very, very strange if it didn't. And uh, we, you know, I'm hoping that a similar kind of path will occur for the computational storage side of things that NVMe brought to the storage side of things. Okay, thank you all. The next question, I'm going to start with Pong. Uh, this is actually a three-part question that has come in. Um, the first part of it is, what percentage of data at the edge of your experience to be compressible? Uh, but then once you start addressing that, can you provide some examples of edge use cases which have a high percentage of compressible data and some examples which have low percentages and comment on the specific percentages? But finally, how does this affect the capacities of storage devices in these use cases? Yeah, this is a very good question. Uh, but certainly we all understand that the data compressibility is really the solely uh, depend upon the uh, use cases is uh, really uh, case by case. So uh, from what we have seen is that uh, for, uh, I think other than image and video data, uh, all the other uh, data like in the edge environment, they tend to have very high compressibility. Like for example, like a serious uh, data they have from uh, what, what, what we have tested it could be over three. Ratio. So but certainly like for, for the image and the video, uh, once the sensor have already encrypted uh, or an engine, like a hardware engine, then certainly uh, after that, there's a very little residue compressibility left. Uh, to the to the storage hardware, but other than that, we have seen over the board. We have seen very quite exciting, encouraging data compressibility. So rule of thumb is really just uh, between I would say majority four into between two to one and uh, four five to one. Yeah. So thank you, Tang and Mayank. You have a. Uh some additional on that, would you like to share? Yeah, sure. I probably uh, share a little bit of system perspective uh, angle to it. Uh, uh, in my opinion, this is this is the forward progression when we ask the percentage of compressibility, right? Because at the edge, as we all talked about, the need is analytics and how much data we are collecting and it's gonna grow more and more, right? But then there are certain logistical challenges. How much data you want to push from edge to the local data center sitting right in the control room or all the way to the cloud? So there is always a tug of war between the amount of data you want to transmit, which costs money, and the amount of data you want to process at the edge, which also costs money, right? So and that's where uh, computation storage could be very interesting that most of the uh, repetitive things, right, uh, generally if you can offload to the computation storage without moving the data even locally from storage to compute, that uh, gonna grow, that will keep growing because the need of analytics is is continue to grow. So so yeah, I think this is, this is uh, this will continue to grow, and then we need to see more and more percentage of data will be asked to come to get compressed at the edge. Thank, Thank you, you. Mayank. I'd like to take another question, try to get through one or two more questions. Uh, this one, Stephen, I'm going to throw this one to you. Um, I've heard that NVMe is developing an open and vendor neutral standard for computational storage devices. Um, how important do you think standards like this one are for mass adoption of these types of devices on the edge and why? <laughs> well, as a co-editor of the group that's working on that, I probably am a little bit biased. But, <laughs> but that being said, as I've already mentioned, I believe the need for an open vendor neutral standard around computational storage is incredibly important because I think if we have multiple vendors who each have their own different driver models, their own different software stacks, the inability to you know, have a 
stable ecosystem is just going to hinder the market to the point where it won't even take off. I think what we really need to do as a as a community of vendors is get behind some open standards and you know NVMe is one of those it doesn't have to be the only one but it's certainly a very successful one already and a good one to build upon and from there you know working with the open source community we can develop the user space libraries and the application updates that can take advantage of um, of these new devices and kind of back to what uh, my uncle was saying earlier I mean, where I want to get to is a world where the operating systems and the libraries and the applications have been updated in such a way that if I plug in an NVMe computational storage device, the operating system will go, oh, hi, you're a NVMe device. Uh, oh, you have computation. Oh, I know how to ask you what type of computation you have. Oh, and by the way, I also have libraries and the databases know how to take advantage of those libraries. So if this NVMe device has some sort of query engine, mm -hmm. I can actually offload queries from Cassandra or Spark or Splunk or whatever. And that's all going to happen completely transparently to the user. It's literally a case of plug in the device and suddenly the power consumption of the device drops. The performance stays the same. That's, that's where I would like to get to. And I think the way to get there is through open standards and uh, an open source ecosystem of software. And I think NVMe is a very key role to play in, in getting to that goal. Thank you, Stephen. Um, just moving on to try to get through a few more questions. Um, Tong, I had a question here. What could uh, computational storage devices exactly do to seamlessly contribute to, to reducing power consumption in edge environments? Yes. Um, so here, I think uh, the, the really the most convenient or low hanging fruit here is for the computational storage drive to carry out the internal like a hardware based transparent uh, lossless data compression that is totally transparent to the host. So by reducing the data volume like uh, through the compression, we we will write less or even much less amount of data uh, physically into those TLC or like a QLC uh, 3D uh, NAND flash memory. And uh, we all know that uh, really the writing data compared with reading data from the NAND flash memory chip, the writing data or programming data into the physical uh, NAND flash memory is much more like a energy consuming. Uh, compared with the reading, compared with the controller uh, power consumption. So then by uh, transparently reducing the amount of uh, data that need to be physically written into the flash memory, then those uh, the in-storage transparent compression could really seamlessly reduce the power consumption, uh, contribute to the thermal. And then so that is a really the 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 best, like uh, the most convenient way like uh, to contribute to reducing the, the power consumption. But further, like if we want to go uh, one step further as the other speakers ha has already pointed out that uh, uh, we could uh, really can offload some relatively simple and the streaming like a uh, data pre-processing, like, uh, like for example, like when we do the data analytics for the table scan, then we could offload the, those uh, table scan filtering conditions into the drive. So then we can significantly reduce the amount of data that has to be moved from the drive into the host memory, into the host CPU's cache memory. So then that will further contribute to reducing the power consumption. But of course, for that, then we need to do the non-trivial modification to the software stack and then to apply those uh, uh, enhanced interface as yeah, as Steven already mentioned that uh, uh, the NVMe SNEER has been doing great job and to standardize this kind of uh, how we can enhance the interface to enable this kind of uh, computation offloading to happen. Yeah, but still the lowest uh, like a hanging fruit with just the transparent uh, in storage transparent compression. Yeah. 
Great. Thanks, Tom. Um, I'm going to do one last question, um, and then we have a little bit of wrap-up at the end. Um, on this last question, I'd like to throw it out to all three of you and also uh, give you a chance for your parting thoughts on it, just a couple minutes per uh, presenter. But the question is, given the heterogeneity of the edge data and the system, um, how can computational storage add value to the edge? Uh, so, Mayank, I'll start with you. We'll jump from you to Stephen and then to Tong. All right. Thanks, Bill. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, this is the main uh, nature of edge heterogeneity, isn't it? Uh, and it is very important to understand that at the edge, data is at heart. Everything else is just periphery. Uh, two, two main things, TCO and compute for data. Note I'm saying compute for data, not data compute. Uh, for edge servers and gateways, it, it is becoming clear that generic compute should be for uh, management and for, for governance and not for the data processing. Because protocol processing and governance in these heterogeneous environment itself is very expensive. And that's where offloading such data, which we all talked about, uh, such data intensive tasks, which we all talked about, to actual storage device uh, helps the overall nature of heterogeneity and brings some standardization. Because now you have storage with standard interface for common data intensive tasks, serving variety of uh, use, use cases, uh, which can be plugged into any compute entity that is from Raspberry Pi to one new server, right? In the Tauler data center. And then, and that's powerful. I'll, I'll pass it on to Stephen. Yeah, I think, you know, at the risk of flogging the, uh, the horse again, um, you know, I think what's one thing that's very interesting is around standardization, not so much on the computational storage side, but on the IoT data side. So, you know, are we seeing some kind of consensus around what kind of formats or databases this data is being stored in? And I think this is an area where Apache is doing some great work with things like Arrow and Parquet and Drill, because they're providing a common framework or many different types of IoT devices so that the data that resides on the edge servers is at least in some way in some consistent format, right? So whether that's Parquet or something else. And I think that's very important because if we have to process data that's in very, very different types of on-disk format, that gets quite complicated and we don't really want to go there. I think another thing that is very interesting is some of these computational storage devices are quite rigid in what they can do. And I think, you know, as the market is so early, that's, that's pretty fair, right? So we have things like compression, we have things like encryption, but there are other devices out there that are more flexible in what they can do. Um, you know, they use ARM cores to run part or entire operating systems to process the data on disk. I think there's a happy middle ground between the two where we're not taking up all the power and inefficiency of ARM processors to do something, but we're maybe not rigid, as rigid as a single compression engine. Reconfigurable architecture and logic has a role to play there. Application-specific accelerators potentially have a role to play there. Um, and, and so it'll be interesting to see where things get end up there. Because you're right, workloads are homogeneous, and we need to find ways of efficiently addressing that. You know, FPGAs are certainly one technology that can do that, but I think there are others uh, that are emerging that, that also can do some interesting things. And having common on-disk formats to work with is also really important. And uh, I think we're starting to see that happen. Yeah, uh, I think those, my two uh, friends already <laughs> give very good answers uh, to this question. So I think, uh, I think just one point I just want to mention here that certainly this uh, computational storage, uh, even though we have already started to talk about this for a few years, but still uh, it's still very early. 
like uh, we are still at, at the very beginning to explore this uh, very uh, interesting journey and then how we will architect this uh, computational storage drive, but still like in the context of the heterogeneous computing. And then of course we know that why we are forced into this heterogeneous computing because the more raw technology scaling has really rapidly approaching the very end of this kind of very uh, technology scaling. So we, in order to continue to improve the computing efficiency uh, without too much relying on the technology scaling, then we have to rethink the overall system architecture. Then the computational storage drive will play a key role here. But so of course we need to look at, at the bigger picture. Uh, we are not saying the computational storage drive will solve all the problems. We're just saying that uh, computational storage drive will very likely will play a key role to contribute to the entire heterogeneous computing platform to together to deliver the best and the more and the more efficient computing uh, solution. Yeah. Okay, thank you all for your great presentations, for answering the questions that we've had time to answer. Um, I will note that we still have uh, about three or four questions that have come in. Uh, we will be answering that in uh, our blog. So look for the SNEA blog. Uh, we'll mention that again later as we close out the presentation. Uh, but I would like to point out that we will continue the series Storage Life on the Edge. Um, it is a series. Up next, a very interesting presentation on security challenges. Um, I know that in the standard side of things, I've been working on what are the security challenges uh, related to computational storage. And there's a lot of information out there that needs to be considered. Um, that presentation will be on April 27th. Again, same time, same channel, uh, 10 a.m. Pacific, 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, you can get to this. This short link gets you to all of the information about the entire series, both past presentations and future presentations. So go there, register, and come join us for the next in this series. Um, in addition to that, um, SNEA has their persistent memory and computational summit, computational storage summit coming up uh, May 25th and 26th. Um, this is the 10th annual summit. It started out as the PM or persistent memory summit. Last year we added computational storage into it. So this is the second year for this including computational storage with persistent memory. Um, one of the interesting things here is that we will be talking about how the two of these technologies, persistent memory and computational storage, kind of merge together. So um, go out to the website, register for the event. It is a free event. Complimentary registration is now open. So go out there, save your seat, and register. It is a virtual event. Uh, but we'd love to see you all there. There's a lot of good information that will be provided. Um, I'd like to thank you for watching our webcast. I would like to remind you, please, please rate the webcast and provide us with feedback. Your feedback is what we use to try to make these webcasts meaningful for you and something that you will enjoy. So please make sure that you do rate this, but also provide us with our, your feedback. Um, you can find this webcast and many other videos and presentations on this topic in the SNEA Educational Library. Again, if you downloaded the slides, the link is there to get to that. Uh, the questions and answers, all of the answers that were provided uh, on the webcast, as well as um, answers to questions that we didn't have time to get to, will be available at sneablog.org. Um, follow us on Twitter um, for announcements on future webcasts, future SNEA events, all sorts of good information about things going in, on in the area of storage, all areas of it, persistent memory, 
computation, cloud, all sorts of informational uh, stuff going on from SNEA. So you can learn more about the Compute Memory and Storage Initiative at SNEA.org slash CMSI. And you can learn more about the Network Storage Forum at SNEA.org slash NSF. Again, thank you very much for your time. I hope that this was useful to you, and I hope you enjoyed the session.